Huh. That was fast. Now that the video has loaded, I'll show you how you can make a loading screen faster than many AAA games can finish loading. We're not going to just make any old loading screen either. I'll also show you how you can make your loading screen more appealing. As game devs, we owe it to our players to make the loading process bearable, especially for games that take a long time. Sometimes the loading screens can be fun on their own. Without further ado, let's load up Godot and get into it. We'll start by making a basic loading screen so we'll have the functionality in place. First, let's create a new Godot scene. Since it's a UI, we can use a canvas layer node as the root node. You can also use a control node as the root, but I find the canvas layer works well when it comes to separating different screens. Underneath that, we then add our control node and change the anchors to full rect. Right underneath that, we'll add a texture rect, which is also fully rect. Add a gradient texture 1D to the texture rect and remove the white bar to make a black background. Then we can add some text that says loading by using a label. Arrange the label as you see fit. After that, add a script on a root node and call it something like loading screen. We'll be using logic based on the official Godot docs regarding background loading. I have linked the page in the description if you want to check it out. Basically, we'll be using a singleton class called resource loader that can load the scene we specify behind the scenes. For those who are uninitiated, a singleton is a programming technique that allows you to use the class name to access properties and methods without instantiating copy first. Unlike static functions, which can also be accessed with the class name, singletons are actually objects that can be modified during runtime. That means we need to tell the loading screen which scene we want to load. To do this, create an export variable like this that can be used in the editor to pick a scene file. In the ready function, add this line of code to tell the resource loader to start loading the given scene. We will need to check on the resource loader periodically to see if it's finished. So we'll add a code in the process function like this. The load threaded get status function will accomplish this and we can use the built-in enum to check that it's loaded. We can then open our destination scene by adding this logic. Let's also add a set process false called so the process function doesn't get called more than once while we finish loading. The resource loader loads the scene into a pack scene object so we can use that to change our current scene. To test this out, I set the project's main scene to the loading screen and then in the editor, I set the target scene to the main test scene. When I run the game, it works a little too well. Just so we can tell it's actually working, let's add a small delay in the code so we can see the loading screen first. The target scene isn't too big, so it takes no time to load. When I try again, we can actually see the loading screen this time. Don't forget to remove the delay unless you like it there. We now have the basic functionality in place, but it's not very useful in this state. Suppose you want to use the loading screen to transition from any scene to any scene. We can do this by making a singleton of our own that provides a function that will handle instantiating the loading screen for us. Add a new script in your project and call it something like functions. This class can also be useful for functions that are extremely generic, but can be used anywhere, such as formatting time. Before we add the code, go to your project settings in Godot. Click the auto load tab, add your new class file, and enable the global variable checkbox. This tells Godot to load the script when the game loads, which also makes it function like a singleton. Now back to the code. Create a function like this with a parameter that lets you specify the scene path. Add this logic here to preload the loading screen scene and make an instance of it. Then we will assign the next scene path to the instance so it knows where to load to. Finally, we add the scene as a child to the active scene. To test this function out briefly, I made a dummy scene with a button that'll load the main scene like before. I added the logic to the button to call our new function, and you can see that it works. If you're enjoying this video so far, I would appreciate it if you see it all the way through. I really want my effort making videos to benefit everybody, and watching the video all the way tells YouTube to promote it to a bigger audience. This also helps me build an audience for my game Flick, while also giving back to the community. Thank you so much. Now back to the tutorial. Now that we have a function to load from anywhere, how can we make the loading screen more flexible? By adding the ability to pass parameters to the new scene. Is that even possible though? The get tree methods that we used before don't support parameters. However, with the help of some official Godot documentation and some manual scene arrangement, we can make this work. To get started, let's add a script to our main scene. Add a parameter variable like this because it'll need to exist on the scenes we intend to load. Then add a code to print the parameters to the console as a test. See that it's empty if I ran the scene alone. Next, go to the loading screen script so we can make the proper changes to the loader. Also, add a parameters variable of the same type here as a pass through between scenes. After that, replace the change scene line with this code to instantiate the target scene and assign the parameters. To achieve the same effect as the change scene function, we'll need to first temporarily assign the current scene as a variable. Then we'll need to add our new scene as a child to the root node and assign the current scene to our new node. It's very important that we do this in the exact order because you can't assign a scene as a current scene if it's not in the scene tree yet. Create the old scene that's in the temporary variable at the end and I'll take care of the scene swapping. Right before we test this out, go back to the function script and add a parameters parameter to the load function, along with a line to assign the parameters to the loading screen. To test this one out, I edited the dummy scene's buttons to pass it to a dictionary. Now if I run it, you should see it now echoes the parameters once we reach the new scene. It's great that our loading screen works now, but it's really quite boring to look at. So let's load it up with some cool visuals. Since this code I'm about to show you is from Flick directly, I won't create the content on the fly. Instead, I'll give you a walkthrough of the scenes and the code. Originally, I planned on making a loading screen that would cycle tips and would 
would have a little animated graphic to illustrate just the tip. However, it was taking too much effort to make the graphics for each tip, so I settled on this instead. The result reminds me a lot of the loading screen you see in Donkey Kong Country Returns. Anyway, here's a glimpse of my loading screen scene tree. I added labels for the tip title and the tip details. I also have the loading label in the center of the screen with its own animation player. I'll explain that in a bit. For the tips, I edited the script to include an array of elements like this. I probably should have put this information in a separate file, but I'm lazy, so here it is. In the ready function, I randomly select a tip to display by rolling a random number between the size of the array, and then I update the labels accordingly. To make the animated background, I had to get a little creative. I reused the mountain background assets I had and duplicated them four times so they line up twice the screen's length. I wanted to make the mountains a solid color, so I did this by making a very basic canvas item shader. To make the shader, I selected all four mountains and added a new shader material here. The shader is extremely simple. It's just a couple lines of code that override the color of the sprite with the one I choose. I then group the four mountain sprites under a separate node TD so I can animate them together more easily. For the animation, I ran to a bit of an issue though. I wanted to loop several assets in the animation. However, to loop them seamlessly on the same timeline, they would have to have the same duration. I wanted the player to walk faster than the mountains, for example. To do this on one timeline, I would have to duplicate the player's walk animation on the same track, which gets messy because I can't set the end frame and the start frame at the same time like this here. I could in theory just put the frames really close together, but that didn't feel very good to me. Instead, I decided to make an animation player for each looping animation so they can have their own duration. For the mountains, I made a simple 4 second animation where I moved the mountains from the left side all the way to the right side and made sure to check the loop and autoplay on load buttons. For the character, I did mostly the same thing. I copied the sprite from my player scene and applied the same shader to it with a white color. However, I had to duplicate the shader or else I'd be editing them all at once. The player moves from one end of the screen to the other, like the mountains, but over 2 seconds instead of 4. To account for the sprite animation, I made a third animation player that basically loops the walking frames accordingly, which is even shorter. As for the ground, I literally just took a block sprite, applied the same shader, and stretched it a little. Now we get into the meat and potatoes, the initial loading screen animation. First, I animated the modulate property of the background, which is a black color rect, from transparent to full color over half a second. For the tip text labels, I started with moving them off the screen about 3840 pixels away, and then moved them to the center of the screen over half a second. To make the animation more dynamic, I offset these animation tracks so they happen slightly delayed from each other. Once the labels reach the center of the screen, I added a squash animation to each of them. The squash animation works by setting the X scale to half and back to full again. For the loading label, I didn't do too much other than animate the modulate property but a bit delayed. And finally, to fade in the sprite work, I grouped all the sprites under a new node to D and animated the modulate of that group like this. As far as code tweaks go, I wanted to make sure the player taps on the screen to start the level before it opens, so I add some logic in the process function to change the loading labels text to signal that the loading is complete. I then added a GUI input function that attaches to the background color rect so that the user can click on the screen to start when the loading is done. To fade out the screen, I just played the init animation in reverse and then switch scenes once the animation finished. And that's more or less what I did. While working on this, I referenced a very helpful GDQuest article for the scene transitions. That link is in the description as well. With all that said and done, here's the final loading screen once again. That's all there is for this video. Don't hesitate to leave a comment if you have any questions. Thank you for watching and have a great day, as always.